the 12th chapter. Verse 2. Something was paid for. 
We need to understand that when we see the cross, we've been purchased. We've been bought. We've been paid for in the blood of Jesus. Jesus died to secure us, to give us our freedom, our spiritual freedom. When we see the cross, it does not just symbolize God's atoning work, but it symbolizes to us the sacrifice that was paid. Somebody say, thank God for the cross. Thank God for the cross. We won't be before you long, but we want to do this text justice. As we look at our text today, I know many of you were probably expecting to hear a sermon from one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, talking about how Jesus has risen. And we'll get there in a minute. We'll get there in a minute. But what I want you to know today is that had it not been for the cross, the celebration of us coming together to celebrate he's risen wouldn't be as meaningful. Amen. And to make that point plain, uh, somebody has a program today. How many of you have a, a, a program that shows the picture of Jesus being resurrected? The risen. Anybody have this program? Anybody have this one? Okay. But then someone else, others in the congregation, have this one. How many of you have? The cross. We did that purposely. Probably would have never known if we hadn't said anything. But we want to make the point plain. There is no resurrection if the cross does not proceed. You can't have resurrection if Jesus didn't die on the cross. The message is simply this. We come out on Sunday mornings, to, especially this Sunday morning, to celebrate the fact that our Lord is risen. He rose from the grave with all power in his hands. And we're so glad that he got up. But there would be no need for him to rise had it not been for the cross. He died to pardon our sins. So as we look at this text, I just want to share a few things with you and we'll soon be out of your way. As we look at uh, the context from Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse 1, the apostle, uh, the writer of this um, testament, the writer of this uh, chapter, the writer of this book, is presumably the apostle Paul. Uh, and what he's saying here in the first verse of chapter 12 is that we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. And we, the, the witnesses are like they're cheering us on. We're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And we need to let alone the weight and the sin that does so easily beset us and run the race that's before us. So what he says there in that first verse is such a power-packed statement that we're going to dive into it just a little bit. So what he says here is that, first of all, he's picturing the Christian walk as a race. And you know, if you're reading the Bible, you know that there's been a lot of um, uh, terms that are given in, in, in race terminology. Whenever, whenever the Word of God is talking about Christianity, sometimes it mentions it as a race. It's a race. So the author of this story tells us that this is a race that we are in. This is a race. And he's saying, first of all, that we are we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. Now these witnesses, if we do it justice, these witnesses that are being spoken of, we have to turn back to the 11th chapter to see some of the stalwarts and some of the, uh, those who have gone on before us, those who are called the heroes of faith. Anybody know about the heroes of faith? The Bible talks about Abraham and Moses and uh, Enoch and Joseph and Sarah and Rahab. They were soldiers of the faith. They were heroes of the faith. Why were they heroes? They were heroes because they had a, a, a method of operation. They operated by faith. And because they operated by faith, their names are recorded in scriptures as being heroes of faith. Well, God wants us to know that if we are going to be called heroes of faith, we too must operate in faith. We need to operate in faith. And faith is no more and is no less than acting on the word of God. Sometimes we try and make faith so difficult, we try and make it so complicated, but faith is really easy, quote unquote. Faith is no more and it's no less.
than acting on the word of God. So once you know what the word of God is, you know what God has spoken to you. When you act on that, that's describing, demonstrating faith. Once you act on the word. Next, he goes on to say that not only are we surrounded by these clouds of witnesses who have gone before us, it's like we're in the race and they're in the, in, in the, in the stands cheering us on. Come on, you can make it. You can do it. Come on, you can, don't give up. Don't quit. You can make it. You can make it. They're, they're, they're cheering us on, those who have gone before us. The word of God says that we're not to let any weight allow, uh, we're to take off the weights that would cause us to stumble and fall. Anybody have some weight that you're carrying? Amen. All of us have some weight, some, some excess baggage, some extra luggage that we need to get rid of. If we are carrying on, carrying this weight, God wants us to know that we can't do ministry like he wants us to do it, carrying all these heavy bags, carrying all this heavy luggage. Anybody ever been to the airport and you were going on a trip for a long time and you had all this luggage you had to carry? How does it make you feel having to go through airport, go through security, carry all these bags? You can't wait till you get to the counter to check all this mess in, right? Well, God is saying to us today, check in your mess. I'm here to take your bags. Why do you have to carry it? Don't carry it. Let me carry it for you. And I've come to tell you that there may be some weight that someone's carrying here today. God sent me to tell you that he's here to take your baggage. He wants you to give your luggage to him. The things that hold you down, the things that hold you captive, give it to him. He wants to take your bags. Next, the word of God says that not only we lay off the weight, but there's some sin that easily besets us. And all of us have some sin, amen. All of us have some things that hold us captive. And as we look at this particular word, it's not mentioning uh, sins in general. It's saying that there's probably one sin that holds us. And everybody knows what that one, everybody knows what your one sin is. Some of us left this morning, we had to kind of, you know, push the closet, clothes for all the skeletons came. Amen. Amen. We've got some things that we're holding on to, some sin that holds us captive. But God says he's the God who can take those sins from us. He's the God who, who wants you to release all of that to him. He's the God who will not only just hear about your sins, but he'll forgive you, he'll restore you, he'll call you back home. He wants to be your God. We need to release that sin to him. And what is sin? Sin is anything that separates us from the love of God. Sin separates us from God. See, God is too holy to reach down to a sinful man. And man is too sinful to reach up to a holy God. So what God did was he put a plan in place to allow uh, uh, the bridge gapper. Somebody say Jesus is a bridge filler. As you look at the cross, the cross is stuck on the earth, but yet it extends into the air. Because God is too holy to reach down to sinful man, and it's too sinful to reach up to a holy God. God used the cross to bridge the gap. God used the cross to bridge the gap. But not just anybody could be placed on this cross. It had to be an unspotted lamb. It had to be someone that was whole. Someone who walked the earth as we do, but yet never sinned as we do. Someone who felt the infirmities that we feel, went through the, the storms that we go through, went through the rain that we've gone through, but yet remained sinless. Someone who in all parts was tempted like as we are, yet was without sin. That was the one who had to die on the cross. Had to be an unblemished lamb, someone that was pure, someone that's holy. So when God saw his son bridge the gap between earth and heaven, he accepted that sacrifice as pure. Because of the cross, we now have the right to go back to heaven. We are now atoned, our sins are forgiven. So if God has forgiven us, uh, forgiven us of our sins, why can't we forgive ourselves? Why can't we forgive ourselves? God's forgotten it. If we've confessed it to God, he's wiped the slate clean. We need to wipe the slate clean. Yes, he's forgotten. Yeah, and there are some people who remember. People have all memories. But God's forgotten. And if he's forgotten, we too should forget. So he says to lay off the weight and lay off the sin. 
And then he also says that we are to run this race, run this race. It means endurance, it means perseverance. God never says that he's going to only come back for those who run the race fast, who get through quickly. Nor does he say, I'm coming back for only those who run the race slowly. Nor does he say, you pace yourself, I'm coming back for you. But he doesn't say any of that. He says, just finish the race. I know how to cheat it. Just finish your race. Each of us has a race to finish. God wants us to finish our race. Look at somebody and ask, are you going to finish your race? Are you serious? Amen. As we look at the first verse, the first verse tells us, it gives us a picture of the entrance fee, what it costs to get into the race. It also talks about the actual performing of the race. But as we look at our text, verse 2, it tells us, it, it draws our focus to the finish line. Look at our, let's look at our text. Our thematic statement is this. For Jesus, the cross represented a place of necessary transition from this life to the next. That is, if mankind was to be redeemed. For us, no cross, no crown. There are four different translations here, but I would like to draw your attention to um, the, the, the Message Bible translation. It says, keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it, because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way, cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there, in the place of honor, right alongside God. So for Jesus, the cross represented a place of necessary transition. Necessary transition. For Jesus, he could have died any other way. There could have been a multitude of ways in which he could have died. But the cross was prescribed for him. The cross represented to Jesus a way through. I say it again, the cross for Jesus represented transition. It represented a way through. The cross positioned Jesus for glory. No cross, no crown. When we look at our crosses, all of us have some crosses that we must bear. Don't look at your cross as opposition, but look at your cross as opportunity. God wants you to use your cross to get glory, to get him glory and to glorify his name through the cross we bear. So as we look at our text, it first of all says here, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So as we are trying to get to where Jesus is, if we are trying to uh, allow God to use us, and if we want to be positioned where God can use us best, the first thing it says here is to look to him who's the author and the finisher of our faith. So as an author, anybody ever think wrote a book or wrote a story? When you're doing some writing, as the author, you know the beginning of the story, you know the progress of the story, and you know how the story's gonna end. How do you know all that? Because you're the author, you're, you're writing. Jesus wants us to know that he is the author of our lives. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. 